Okay, so it looks like everybody's in. Um, I'm Avery Dickens de Giron, the Executive Director of the Center for Latin American Studies. And I'd like to welcome you all to our second day of Haiti Week 2021. Today we're hosting a conversation on Translating Haiti, a conversation with Nathan Dyes and Vanessa K. Valdez. So Dr. Nathan Dyes just finished to, just defended his thesis here at Vanderbilt. Congratulations. Hey, Nathan. Hey. Um, he's in the Department of French and Italian, and he's the content curator, translator, and co-editor of the Digital History Project, A Colony in Crisis, the San Domingue Grain Shortage of 1789. He also co-edits Haiti in Translation, um, which is an interview series for H. Haiti. And he's translated poetry and fiction by numerous ha Haitian authors. His most recent translation of Mackenzie Orsell's The Immortals was published in November 2020 with SUNY Press. We're also very happy to welcome back to Vanderbilt Vanessa, Dr. Vanessa K. Valdez. Mm. She's the director of the Black Studies Program at the City College of New York. She holds degrees from both Yale and Vanderbilt, and her research interests uh, focus on the cultural production of Black peoples throughout the Americas, including the United States, Brazil, and the Caribbean. She's also the author of Oshun's Daughters, The Search for Womanhood in the Americas, and of Diasporic Blackness, The Life and Times of Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Her latest book, Racialized Visions, Haiti and the Hispanic Caribbean, was published in 2020 and is an edited collection that recenters Haiti in the disciplines of Caribbean studies and Latin American studies. So a warm welcome to both Nathan and Vanessa. For the members of our audience, uh, I just want to let you know that they will start out with a conversation and then they will open up the floor to um, questions so you will have a chance to interact. Uh, and we will also hold this, we will end the, um, the session at one o'clock. So we'll keep it to 50 minutes. So thank you all for being here and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Nathan and Vanessa. Well, thank you so much, Avery, for having us. Thank you to the Center for Latin American Studies um, for having us and for this fifth edition of Haiti Week too. Um, this has been a wonderful tradition that I'm so glad to be a part of, um, to have been a part of pretty much the entire time I've been at Vanderbilt. So thank you for creating that five years ago when I got here. <laughs> um, and um, so we're gonna start with a conversation between um, myself and Vanessa. Vanessa, how are you? I'm, I'm really happy. I was explaining prior to, thank you to the Center of Latin American Studies. Um, you know, I graduated from this school in 2007. And so this is, this is a beautiful return. Thank you to the members of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese that are in the virtual room. Um, thank you to my dissertation advisors who are in the room <laughs> as well. Um, you know, uh, it, I, it's been a long time since I set foot on Vanderbilt's campus. And, you know, while I, I would have actually enjoyed going back for this, um, but I'm very happy we could do it this way. So I thank everyone who has made this possible. And so do you wanna start with, um, I have a place where I think we could both start and um, sure. it's, a, it's a subtext in, in my translation of Mackenzie Orsell's The Immortals, but it's, it's very much uh, with, embedded within the text of everything actually that you wrote for uh, Racialized Visions, as well as sort of the larger project of Racialized Visions. Um, and that's the work of um, Miriam J. A. Chansey. Yes. Um, I have to say, uh, and I, I've told her this, that one of the most impactful things that she ever wrote, to my mind, was a book review that she did um, called When Outsiders Tell the Tale about um, recent books released about the earthquake um, that struck Haiti on January 12th, 2010. And um, she takes this idea about the perspective of who writes about Haiti and who writes about the earthquake. Mm -hmm. And um, before she launches into her review of the two works in question, um, she sort of has this, she pauses and has this moment when she says, Haitians have been writing about this earthquake ever since it happened. Mm -hmm. There need to be more translations about books where Haitians are talking amongst Haitians about the impacts of the earthquake. And so this need to translate, this need to 
um, sort of focus in on conversations that are happening within the Caribbean, either intra-island um, or inter-island as a way of shifting our perspective in understanding the region, its people, its history, its culture, its literature. Um, I just offer that up because I think that's a, a beautiful um, way of entering into both of these works and sort of how we approach um, the two books. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, I write about in, <laughs> in uh, racialized visions, I write the genealogy of the book um, and essentially it starts with Miriam Chansey, right? It starts with her book, um, from sugar to revolution, which you know, since we're oh, you can't, yeah, you can't, maybe sort of, no, you can't. There you go. From sugar to revolution, women's visions of Haiti, Cuba, and the Dominican Republic, um, which was published in 2012, and which I wrote, for which I wrote a, a book review in 2013 in Anthurium. And in this book, uh, in the introduction, she gives a forthright critique of Latin American studies as a discipline and you know, talks about its anti-Blackness as a discipline and cites as its primary example, its erasure of Haiti, um, particularly given that prior to the Duvalier uh, dictatorship that Haiti was regularly studied in, in conjunction with Cuba and the Dominican Republic. And post that, um, it kind of, it, it goes away, right? We don't see that within Latin American studies. And this was a galvanizing thing for me because I had had the experience of in writing Oshun's Daughters, which is a book about uh, African diasporic religious systems or the representations of those systems. Um, I was writing about Candomblé and, and Lukumi religion. And when I would tell people what I was writing about, they said, oh, do you include voodoo? And I didn't know enough about voodoo. And quite frankly, I had never, I hadn't studied Haiti, right? And um, ever, like when I think about my in, the entirety of my educational uh, process, right? Like it's the reason why now as an educator in my black studies classes, like I talk about the Haitian revolution, right? We must talk about this and put it in the same place um, or in, in conversation with the ones that our students know more about. Um, and so at the time, you know, I was, I was reading this book and I'm an African diaspora scholar. I'm a comparatist trained at Vanderbilt University. I focus on the cultural production of black peoples in the hemisphere. And I said, why don't I know about Haiti? And so that, that was it, you know, that for me, it was, I can do this, right? Not, and not, I'm not a specialist in Haiti. I would never solely from this point on write about Haiti, but what I can do is put them in conversation, right? Put the country, put the intellects um, in conversation. And the reality is of what you don't really have to scratch like that, that, that far beneath the surface to be like, oh, I mean, you know what we, in what we read was El Reino de Este Mundo, right? We read Alejo Carpentier, of course. Right, but then we always read that it's like it's divorced from the Haitian context, right? It's divorced from no. He actually goes to Haiti several times, right? He goes, he sees Saint Souci, he sees what, and so that has an effect, and so that, so really, that's you know, years later, that's what racialized visions. That's a result. Racialized visions is a result of that. The first step was 2013. My my review was published. I also start writing on Arturo Schomburg in 2015. Um, and Arturo Schomburg was somebody that he, his first published article was on Haiti. It was in the, uh, on the occasion of the centennial. He collects lots of primary documents about Haiti. Um, so that becomes also like this idea of like, okay, this is a space, not only of liberation that is acknowledged because of the Haitian revolution and the results of it, but also for the intellectual heft, right? For the contributions to the hemisphere you know, and we often think of that in terms of Pan-Africanists, again, later in the 20th century, but this is, this is from the 19th century forward. And so I did a call for papers in Essex Salon, for which I was serving as a book review editor then. I got way too many abstracts for the space, and that's when I knew it was, an edited collection was going to result. I love how it, um, I mean, I started with a book review and then you followed up with a book review. And so much of this feels like um, these books, these projects, these, these intellectual formations. I mean, we talk about like Arturo Schomburg's library, 
the fact that he served as the librarian for Fisk University, um, mm -hmm. spending time with books. I mean, The Immortals is a book about spending time with books and about the escape and the productive nature of that escape and of sort of seeking for something else in books that this world cannot provide or connections that this world cannot provide mm -hmm. when we have sort of the intuition that they're, they're there. They've been there all along. Um, and I mean, we could talk about discipline and we could talk about um, camps and we could talk about sort of um, scholarship and the way that, that it puts those out. But I think sort of staying in that space of that productive space of the possibility. I mean, reading, our, reading um, Diasporic Blackness for me was sort of a revelation because um, it sort of, it made me realize that when I see a picture of um, Langston Hughes standing outside of Sans Souci, um, it's not a mistake that he goes on and co-authors Pipo and Fifina with um, Arna Bontemps, right. also connected to Fisk University, yeah. um, or he goes on to translate Jacques Woumain or any number of other sort of Caribbean artists and writers who are very well aware of the, like the, the importance of these sort of intellectual formations, um, the connections, and, and they're, they, they become part of that genealogy of, of knowledge. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I think I, I think <laughs> I think I talk about the, the the formation of Caribbean studies or the way that we study the Caribbean as like I think Prospero's hallways, right? The idea of like it's language based. It's still following imperial dictates in this post colonial moment or supposedly post colonial moment. When the reality is, it doesn't follow how people have lived, right? It doesn't follow migration, exile. Um, it doesn't follow how ideas have been exchanged. Right throughout the region and beyond the region, right? This is very, it's a hemispheric project. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I remember when I learned that, you know, I mean, there's, there's whole areas of things that we don't know about, right? We don't, and we don't study and we don't. And so I think, you know, there are graduate students and scholars in this room. Part of, for me, what is exciting and what has been exciting is, um, you know, writing you know, Tony Morrison's dictate, write the book you want to read, right? And and follow those nudges, right? And follow the, just like you see something be like just around the corner and you kind of sense that maybe there's more there and don't be afraid when you go through MLA bibliography or JSTOR that there's nothing been written on it. It doesn't mean other people haven't thought it. It means they didn't write it, perhaps in the language that you want to write it in, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. The moment like I realized that's still understudied, right? Like Langston Hughes's exchanges with Roman and Gideng, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's kind of like a cursory, like, oh, there's a negritude, negrismo, Harlem Renaissance connection. And then like, that's it. Like, it's like, okay. Well, what there's something thing? so, there's something so like anti-hierarchical about this idea of collecting too. And, and, and it gets to, you know, what you just said about like, write the book you want to read. You are not going to write the same book that somebody else could write, but you need the materials, you need the objects, you need the ideas, you need the, um, the ephemera, you need, you need to get a feel for, for the, the work that you're working with, uh, the, the materials that you're working with in order to produce that book. And I just think that, I mean, in, in terms of like just the frame of collection, what you've offered here in Racialized Visions as the editor, bringing together um, what all these scholars are offering. You know, we have, we have essays on, um, uh, Cuban poets' engagement with um, Jacques Boumin. We have um, uh, Gutierrez Alea's uh, La Ultima Cena, sort of expanding our, our understanding of the, just the connections in the between the Cuban Revolution and the Haitian Revolution. Um, have all sorts of essays looking at at cultural work from you know the late 19th century all the way to you know the 21st, like yesterday. <laughs> um, and, and I, I love the way that you provide a presence for um, all of this work that's happening outside of academia in your, in your afterward or your, I guess the coda of the, of the volume where, you know, um, Dominicans are organizing on behalf of Haitians who have suddenly lost their citizenship due to La Sentencia in 2013. Um, you're talking about, um, uh, kinship between Edwidge Danticat and Juno Diaz. You're talking about um, just community initiatives and things like that. It's like, 
well, hold on a second. Like this world is much larger than the bubble of the university or the production of knowledge that is viewed as quote unquote, the production of knowledge, because let's not forget before Arturo Schomburg's library became the Schomburg Center, it was a private collection of, a, of, of his own, of his own making too, and of his own vision. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I just want to, oh, I want to say a couple of things. One is La Sentencia, you know, I've learned from Dominican activists and Dominicanists, right? It did not de-nationalize de uh, Haitians. It's an, it denationalized Dominicans, right? Mm. Of Haitian descent, right? And that's, that's a key thing because that's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about like, right. how do you, how do you strip citizenship from peoples, right? And then how do you move it back, right? Because it was, initially like a certain year and then it's like actually no it's this many generations back um you right, know it's all the way back to 1923 if i'm not mistaken right or something yeah. somewhere in there yeah in the 1920s um and so that's a really key that, that's key because again danielle 1929 thank you danielle. Um, and yeah it's really important to know that intellectual production does not only occur in the ivory tower right and it also doesn't only occur in ways that we can recognize, right? And so, you know, the book review is a much maligned <laughs> form. Um, or, you know, we as graduate students are trained that so like, yeah, you know, you get your foot wet doing that, but really focused on your, your articles, right? Well, right. in Afro-Latin American studies, that's, a, that's a, a, a field that is still in formation. Right. And so for me, I mean, I know when I came up for tenure and promotion for that first vote, one of the feedbacks I got was well, you have something like 20 book reviews, you know, and you have this many articles. Right. I also had this many books, but whatever. Right. And, and I had said, I said, yes, but the book, when I write a book review, that means that that book A has gotten reviewed because the majority of those books were the, the reviews were published in Hispania, which is the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese. So this is, again, the field. This is like a major journal. That person can then get that review on their CV. Then that becomes legible to that person's committee and that person's ten tenure and promotion committee in that school, right? And that, I mean, so that work is often invisible, right? And so we take for granted the writing of book reviews, but really for, all of our, for, for fields with black peoples in it, African diaspora, Caribbean, African Latin, uh, Latin American, Afro-Latinx, that counts. And the person who's writing those reviews counts, right? Because you need people to be informed about, about what they're writing and what they're reading. And so, you know, in any given moment, we can look at the whiteness of the publishing industry, there's no statistics on the, well, it's not that there's no statistics. It has not been publicized how white academic publishing is. We right. can guess. Um, and well, so- Well, just the monograph. I mean, the focus on the monograph, I think about, um, for instance, Jeffrey Stewart's biography of Alan Locke. To my knowledge, Alan Locke did not publish a monograph. Um, I mean, I may be wrong on that, but uh, he's most known for his edited collections and his book reviews. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's where- I mean, the book review is capable of connecting people. It's actually capable of connecting people in a way that writing an article or writing a monograph um, may not initially connect someone to another person. Um, right. when, I, when I review Haitian authors and um, for instance, doing a translingual review, uh, writing a, a review in English of a book written in French or in, in Haitian Creole, um, a lot of authors see that as an olive branch and, and want to know why I wanted to review that book. And I'm like, well, I loved your book. And I think putting this in the space in English may lead to it getting translated and you getting access to more readers, like sort of as like a structural critique of like this idea that um, we should constantly be like plowing away at single authored um, articles. Um, you know, I don't know how many people have actually read my one article that I wrote in French um, and was peer reviewed and, and everything. Um, that's okay. But I think my, my book reviewing has like actually led me to more connections between people and from one book to the next. Right. right. That also opens up uh, a, com a question that I have for you, Nathan, which is um, another maligned, overlooked uh, part of 
our universe is translation, of course. And so what led you to translate this novel? Of all the novels you could have, why was this the one that you really wanted to, I mean, you have several, um, but this is the first one out the gate. <laughs> so what led you to that? Yeah, so I, I thank you for that question. I, um, I read this book for the first time in 2014 on um, our cold wintry day in, in Lyon, um, France, when I was there teaching English. And um, I read it in one sitting and um, it wasn't lost on me that the protagonist, one of the protagonists in the novel, uh, Shakira, uh, that's actually how she spends her free time is sort of passing time uh, away from her uh, profession as a sex worker reading um, amid a bunch of her colleagues and friends who have their own escapes, but who don't understand what reading provides for her. And so I, first I was sort of drawn to story. Um, and not that I had forgotten about the novel, but it had been a long time since I had read it. I, I returned to it in, in 2018. Um, for those of you who are familiar with my dissertation work, I, I just finished a dissertation on uh, the power of literature in, in what it can do to help us grieve and what it can help us do to, to mourn the loss of somebody. And um, The Immortals is set uh, just after the 2010, actually before, during, and after the 2010 earthquake on January 12th. Um, and uh, in it, there are these reflections, sort of poetic vignettes that are assembled and arranged in a way that allows you to know the characters with such, you know, in their intimate decor um, to the point where you as the reader, you have to put the book down because you are thrust into this process of grieving, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and translating that as a whole nother um, <laughs> layer of, of, of engaging with that grief. Um, but as I finished my dissertation prospectus for a project that looked very different from the final project that I, had, um, that I just concluded, um, I was I was looking for something that I could do that would bring to that would sort of make the theories that I was throwing into this dissertation prospectus all of these ideas I, you know they didn't seem of this world and they didn't seem um, kind of like they were helping you know one of the central questions to my dissertation that I just finished is how can literature help and literature helped me get over a sort of this feeling of um, in action by being part of the academy or being or writing something highfalutin that nobody but you know the five people in my committee are going to read that you know a lot of people are telling me maybe it would be jettisoned anyway mm -hmm. for whatever became the introduction to um, the meaningful work that I would do in the years following that you know 30 page prospectus um, and so really just turning to that book as as a way of a reading for comfort. Um, and then I started translating it um, because I wanted to read it differently. Um, Kyle Glover has spoken very convincingly about this idea of translation as um, the closest form, the most intimate form of, of reading that you can perform. And um, I would have to agree because there were times when I was translating um, parts of this book where there's literally the passing of a human from this world into the next um, in a way that is both poetic, yet banal, yet ordinary. Um, and to just have to sit with that and, 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 and be there. Um, I, I, I felt like the literature really just, it performed what I wanted it to do and then even more. And, and, and I felt that I owed it a sort of a, a, a debt of gratitude and wanted to sort of continue working with this text. Um, and so I translated a 3000 word uh, segment of it and ask the publisher if the rights were available and sort of was just like taken by this idea of like, well, maybe, just maybe, just maybe, just maybe. Um, and then um, it happened. You also had a hand in, in that happening, um, <laughs> encouraging me to go to that book exhibit, the, the infamous book exhibit at the MLA where people's, uh, people go in with an empty backpack and come out with uh, a hunchback. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that gift. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of how I came to that project and and um, and what how I engaged with it 
in the in the first instance and um sort of in the long term it's led to a shift in in my scholarship and the way that i engage with with haitian letters and um i want more than nothing for um haitian books to be available for english readers um i also want nothing more than for people who write about Haiti in English to write with care and to do so carefully. And in order to do that, I believe wholeheartedly that we need more books that do not involve white characters, that um, involve women who are complex, um, queer people, um, all sorts of the full spectrum of, of life so that um, everything does not get you know, crystallized down into um, north-south relations, geopolitics, or um, this thing that people can't seem to understand about Haitian spirituality um, that a lot of people misspell all the time, um, but that is actually spelled V-O-D-O-U. Um, and this novel happily contains so much of that. Um, and the, the work that I have underway is, is working closer towards that goal. Yeah. I want to. I thank you for the opportunity to remind the audience or to bring attention to the audience that there is a um, constitutional crisis happening in the nation right now, and we are at this. At, and we, the United States, I ask everyone to pay attention to the reporting of that event um, or of those occurrences at the same time that the U.S. Senate is conducting an impeachment trial against a prior president who did not. He himself did not want to cede power. Um, and look at how those two things are being reported on, the adjectives that are being used, um, and see it as an opportunity for yourselves to, how would you write it differently, right? Because again, there are scholars in training at the moment. Um, there, are, there are scholars in this room. There are people who do, who write the op-eds, who write the letters to the editor. Um, but again, I, I say particularly to the graduate students, um, please know that there is a broad and wide op open world for you. And that's also a way. Um, you are probably not being explicitly trained on how to write an op-ed, um, but you can read something and be offended by it and know how to correct it and know what it would look like um, without bias. And so I do wanna say that. Thank you, Paula Covington. Yeah, Sabata Oliveja. I mean, I was speaking with a student earlier today um, who runs the Atlantic World Archive on the Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, a wonderful account, by the way. Yes, it is an amazing, amazing, amazing account. Um, and we were speaking about in the, uh, a recent post, she was talking about having translated in Portuguese. Um, there she is. Um, <laughs> Earl Fitz is in this room. I remember Earl Fitz talking about the vast majority of things in Portuguese that have not been translated, right? Um, when we talk particularly about um, black authors across the hemisphere in all the languages, like we can talk about the fact that they have not been translated. Yeah. Um, the Dutch Caribbean authors, I mean, that is when I was the book review editor at SX Salon, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do was have a section of that, that journal, that digital journal that was, was treating the Caribbean holistically. Mm -hmm. And so you would see book reviews that were about, Fran you know, about the Francophone Caribbean, about the Hispanophone Caribbean, about the Anglophone Caribbean. And the one place we didn't was the Dutch Caribbean because even the scholarship about the Dutch Caribbean is in Dutch. And right. so um, there again, vast and broad the opportunities that are before you. <laughs> Please never ever think that there are limited opportunities. There's so much work to be done. Well, and absolutely. Um, and, and that would sort of be, I mean, that I think that's a call to people to get in touch with um, book, book review editors across a broad spectrum of, of academic journal to public um, facing um, websites and, and to sort of see where you may fit, where you may fit into those um, projects that they have ongoing. And they do have a very um, acute understanding of what their project is and what type of writing they're looking for. But, um, you know, I came, I came to a lot of this via Twitter. Um, I've, I, I'll say it, you know, loud and proud that um, 
more opportunities in the academy have come to me via Twitter than they have via a handshake or a schmooze during um, a conference. Um, and that's because it's public and people need to see you out here and people can read who you are out in public. And um, I also want to, you, you made a comment about um, what gets published and, and or sort of gestured towards what gets published and, and translation and black authors in general. And um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say Evelyn Tuyo just had a wonderful piece that she published with Words Without Borders, um, a, a global um, collective dedicated to the translation of world letters um, broadly, very broadly construed. And um, in it, she called for um, an understanding or at least a recognition of you know, what gets published, not what gets translated is often an editor's vision of what readers want, not what people are actually writing in that country. Um, and so when I first came to The Immortals and, and the prospect of maybe getting it published, I said to myself, I'm like, man, I'm really worried about this book because I don't know that anybody's going to take a chance on a book that is written, that's a novel, um, said to be a novel written in poetic fragments um, about sex workers in Haiti. Um, and I was so happy to be proven so tremendously wrong um, that this book would not sit on a shelf or in a drawer um, and that people would be able to read it. Um, and I think that we need to pay attention to who's doing the translating um, as well. Um, there are the best of intentions a lot of times from people who engage with literature um, across the world. And it's really hard to be well read in everything absolutely understandable. Um, but taking the time and the patience and the care to, um, to do your background reading, to understand the way that a word is spelled can have um, you know, extreme consequences for the idea, for, for somebody's humanity, um, because you're tying them into, and this is about the spelling of vodou, um, you're tying them into a system of oppression that's um, sort of been edified a, a century ago, um, even, even beyond. Um, and that you need to, as a translator, participate in it actively in its undoing. Um, and as well, um, there, there just needs to be a better way of providing, uh, there need to be more translators of color, um, more translators from the regions of the places that are being, um, of the, where the books are being published and, and written, um, black translators. There are in fact, black translators as well. I think we need to say it and we need to teach um, the black translators as well, because um, I mean, so many people have access to Jacques Wouman's um, chef d'oeuvre, uh, Masters of the Dew, thanks to Langston Hughes and Dr. Professor Mercer Cook, right. um, who is in a lot of ways, the innovator of um, what is now being dubbed black French studies. Um, so I, I offer that, um, there's a lot to be there's a lot to be read, and I'd be glad to provide anybody with uh, reading notes because uh, I read a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to say also you just um, touching on what you just said. So oftentimes when we think about Afro Latinx studies and Afro Latin American studies, um, you know, there is a thought of oh, okay, well, certainly the way that I learned Afro Hispanic literature and the um, note that I added in diasporic blackness was I traced it back to the civil rights movement, right? And in this country, and then the rise of an interest in um, Afro-Hispanic populations. And really that work even precedes that. And it, and it is to be found in HBCUs by professors like Mercer, Mercer Cook and you know black academics in HBCUs who are publishing in the Journal of Negro History, Carter Woodson's Journal of Negro History and College Language Association Journal. And, you know, these are not new things. Black folks writing, exchanging ideas across uh, national boundaries is not new. It's just that we are not taught to look there. We are taught to look at, you know, the AHA journal and mm -hmm. the MLA journal. Um, and so that's also really key. And- Can I share something that I found sort of just as a curiosity that, that speaks to this so well? There's a there was a, a black French teacher at Tennessee State University. Um, she actually ran for governor of Tennessee twice. Um, her name was uh, Virginia Simmons Niabongo. She, um, she married African royalty. Um, I forget whether it was Ghana or, or whichever country, but 
um, she wrote a book review of Sylvia Winter's The Hills of Hebron for the Tennessean. <laughs> I mean, in 19, I think in 1962 or 1963, I mean, there's like, you sit with that and you're like, wow. <laughs> right. um, and let's talk about Sylvia Winter being a Jamaican, a uh, Cuban born Jamaican who has studied in Anglophone, but was a professor of Spanish in the University of West Indies. Right, like right. that kind of connections, right? And how those things are dictated by, again, you know, language oftentimes. I also did wanna say something, I wanted to highlight what you just said about choice of texts mm -hmm. and move it away from, text to translate, I mean, um, mm -hmm. and move it away from a market-based analysis, mm -hmm. this idea of like, what will they read? Um, let's try to figure that out. Let's read the tea leaves and, um, to say, you know, one of the things that I've learned along the lines of Toni Morrison's dictum is if it resonates with me as a person, it is going to resonate with other people on this 8 billion peopled uh, planet. And that's what guides me more. It's not, I don't try to read the tea leaves. I go, this is my curiosity. So often, so what essentially what that means is again, the, the books that I write, the books that I edit, the books that I green light as a book series editor are books that I know need to be out there because um, I either long for them or I can talk to people and they've longed for them. And, you know, again, it is up to us to make the academy that we want to see and to make the world that we want to see. And the we, you know, can't, you know, overdo the, we, we can't take over, well, we can take over the academy. It's just one person at a time. Um, and I do want to acknowledge here both Benigno Trigo and Earl Fitz who are in this room. Um, Earl Fitz, God bless you, I tell you this when I talk to you. Earl Fitz, 20 years ago, 21 years ago, told me that the Academy would need my voice and I had no idea what he meant. And mm -hmm. I, every day that I do anything, I remember that man and Benigno Tadigo who gave me the discipline of writing and led me to the finish line. Um, and, and if anyone looks at the years in which my books are published, blame Benigno Tadigo for that. And, and, and what we're seeing. Um, so I think we're gonna shift to questions now. What do you think, Nathan? Yes, I think we can shift to questions. Oh, I, I see we have a question. Jonna has a question. Hi, I'm Jonna Moser. I'm the director of Vanderbilt University Press. Thank you so much for this presentation. It seemed to be so overtly engaging with publishing and scholarly publishing that I thought I would ask a question that serves my needs and hopefully, you know, elucidate some things for prospective translators and authors. What can we do as publishers to shift the conversation away from a market-driven analysis to the other types of hurdles that really make it tough for small presses or even big presses like rights clearance and you know the request to handle bilingual or trilingual materials. Like it's a steep climb. And then there are all these features that we end up having to nickel and dime around translation to try to make the numbers work. So is there a way that whether through, you know, graduate training or even, you know, boot camps, we can say, here are ways to craft proposals where you're removing obstacles as opposed to putting obstacles for the publisher in place? Gianna, as the director of a publisher, of an ac academic publisher, like off top, the fact that you're even asking that question. <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm so excited for Vanderbilt University Press. I was oh, in Northwestern, you. but <laughs> like, I'm excited for Vanderbilt. Um, I think Nathan, you have, a, you have a, a different perspective than I do on that. So you go first. Um, so I was sort of on the boundaries and the, 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 the sort of the red tape. Um, a, lot of, a lot of pressure is on, um, the publisher and the people who work for the presses um, to get everything always 100% right. Um, and um, working with a novel that's um, bilingual, Haitian Creole and French um, to expect a publisher to have somebody on staff that would speak you know, all the languages of the world um, and be able to vet that work. You know, In terms of like even like something like that is seemingly banal, like the back ad copy, um, you know that that really matters the production of the object really matters and and um you know just the reception that i've gotten for instance of the immortals in the caribbean be, myself being a caribbeanist and having such a hand in in producing this book has been 
you know, really great. Everybody's so far been really happy with the way that the book came together. Um, and I would just say, I mean, whether you're remunerating people for, you know, the smallest things, like, can you just look at a glossary if a book carries a glossary to make sure that, you know, these, the words carry the proper orthography. Um, you know, I think every small question is worth asking, um, except for to the point where you're going mad. Um, <laughs> Um, but I, I have a, I have a sort of a, a caveat about just publishing in general. Um, you know, as somebody looking to place, uh, Haitian books, um, the thing that I often struggle with is the, the, the barrier that Vanessa actually helps sort of, uh, knock down, which is, uh, there are lots of Latin American literature series. There are not enough Caribbean literature and translation series. And my idea of Latin America includes the Caribbean. And uh, just a small anecdote, when I first declared my concentration in Latin American and Caribbean studies at the University of Maryland, I walked into the office of their director saying, I shouldn't have to take Spanish or Portuguese. French is spoken in Latin America and the Caribbean, you know, sort of like ready to like, you know, go to war. And she's like, I agree with you. <laughs> Come to find out that she was tra trained by one of Puerto Rico's most eminent French studies scholars, um, at the time, Ana Lidia Vega. Um, so yeah, I just, that's sort of what I have to offer. Um, and I'd love to talk more um, about this because I have all the feels about producing books. Well, when you guys wanna do a workshop for translation proposals, I'm in. Well, thank you, Jana. I did also wanna say, including explicitly on a website with regards to submissions, you know, normally it's monographs and edited collections, add translation in there, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. just even like linguistically, like just highlight, yes, we offer you, this is a safe place to publish translations because Nathan can give you the five publishing houses, right? Like that have this, the, one of the reasons that, you know, it was really easy as the book series editor of Afro Latinx Futures, if you look at my description, that is, it is, a, it's humanities and social sciences. It is Latin America and the Caribbean. It is like hemispheric. Thank you, uh, Earl Fitz. Um, you know, it, it is everything that I believe in, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm, but part of that was quite frankly, because we were so early, you know, the series started April, I signed the contracts April, 2018. Um, and then it was the idea of it's still in formation, right? So when Nathan pitched it, it was like, yeah, we're gonna expand, we're gonna do edited volumes and monographs and translations. And it's not a very academic, like it's not a translation that carries a bibliography or extensive footnotes. A dissertation chapter I, I wrote about the immortals and you know, that only appears in touches in, in the afterward. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want that. You know, we didn't want that to be the way that the book had to look. Um, we have a question in the chat um, from Benino, Benino Trigo. How do you approach the sacred or the spiritual in Haitian cultural production in an academic, humanist, and secular context? Go, Dr. Dice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you have to approach it um, at, at first. Um, you, you, that's that's got to be the first step. And... Um, you have to engage with not just one medium. It can't just be the academic text. Um, Same uh, Marlena, yeah. Doubt, Dr. Marlena Doubt has been, um, her, her Twitter handle is Fictions of Haiti, has been posting every single day, three to four artworks by Haitian visual artists. Um, for now, she's working on painting, but um, you cannot look at one of those pieces of art and not see sort of the secular, the, the, the sacred, the profane and everything in between in the way that these painters are, are producing their works. Um, you also have to take into account um, markets, what people want to see, um, sort of this naive art um, that there was, a, it was very much in vogue in the 1950s and 60s, um, taking on sort of uh, almost century defining uh, presence in Haitian visual art. Um, Peter Hafner at Center College is currently working with uh, the impact of uh, commercialism and commercialization tourism on Haitian art. 
um, through a Haitian art historical lens um, and, uh, you know, sort of marketing Vodou. So it has many sides. Um, I'd be glad to sort of provide notes, but it has to be addressed and has to be approached. Um, I will just say with regards to that, as someone who's written a book on African diasporic religious systems, I didn't write a book about African diasporic religious systems. I wrote them about representation. Mm -hmm. um, and that was very, very key because any text that you have, I'm very, we have to look at the history of the writings of the, all of these religious systems that all have been maligned um, outside of a Christian uh, uh, space, right? And so um, that awareness means that you necessarily have to be respectful. Um, if you don't, it's not something I dabble in. Um, you know, I, it's not, oh, I read an article, therefore I can now write about Ersuli. No, you better know which, because again, if anyone who has read Oshun's Daughters, that whole, <laughs> that book is about invocation. And that book is about the mere act of it. When you are going into an, another world's view, an, another epistemology, right? Where the mention of the name means that you are invoking. When it's a painting, when it's a novel, when it's anything, you are, that is an act of prayer. And so you have to be aware of that. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, talk to folks who do it well. Jasmine. Jasmine, please. <laughs> hey guys. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm actually an undergraduate student at City College. I'm Professor uh, Valdez student. So hi. Hi, Dr. Valdez. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm actually really new to um, the whole process of translation. This is actually my second time of like really hearing it and understanding it. So my question, um, and I guess it's to Nathan because you were, we were talking about your translation. Um, how do you manage to translate a text without like mixing your own interpretation and avoid like changing the meaning of what the original author was trying to convey? Like, is there a process or like, are you going back and forth? Like, how does that work? Thank you for that question. Um, and, and this is one that actually keeps me up at night and keeps me from sleeping. Um, I'm in contact with every single author that I translate. Um, and I do that sort of as a practice because I, you know, one, I, I actually really do want to um, engage with their text to a level where they have a, a hand in the production of it in its new life in translation. Um, I think that that's the only ethical way of, of approaching it for me at the moment. Now it's true that um, the authors that I translate are all living. Um, and so that is a, a benefit. That's, a, that's something, that's a luxury I have. Um, there are some people doing real wonderful work translating authors who are who are no longer with us, um, who can't quite you know reach beyond this world into the next and ask them a question about what they meant by a specific word. But um, I read a lot of Haitian literature. I read a lot of scholarship on Haiti. I read. I listen to Haitian radio from 1950 to uh, the year 2000, um, and. So I call from that. I call from everywhere I can to, um, to sort of find the material to work with the language there. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a thing about books written by Haitians in French where there's a, there's a Haitian cadence from time to time in the, in the, in the writing. Um, and I have to kind of get over my own imposter syndrome to say that, you know, as somebody who is a Haitian Creole speaker, as well as a French speaker, um, that I can handle that and I should try to handle that. Um, and so it's a matter of just sort of trusting yourself that you can handle that work. Um, it's okay. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would say, don't worry about your own voice coming through because you know, you're the translator, of course it's gonna come through, but trust your voice and trust yourself to make the right decisions, ethical decisions about how that should be rendered and reach out for help because um, Lord knows that there's not a translation that I've turned in that uh, at least five or six of my friends have not already looked at, read and vetted, so. Thank you for that. <laughs> the cameo from my stepmom. <laughs> Yeah, great. Vanessa, did you want to make a comment on that before we close? 
I did not. I just want to also acknowledge that the several of the contributors to racialized visions are in the room. Um, Arturo Victoriano has, has said something. Um, Erica Serrado is also in this. So I did want to say, hi, y'all. I see y'all too. Thank y'all for contributing to this book. And please, if you get a chance to read the book, their essays are amazing. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Nathan and Vanessa. This was very engaging. It was very informative. Um, we really appreciate your time um, and all of your expertise in sharing it with us.